So welcome to the April um, maturity model for Microsoft 365 practitioners call. <clears throat> we have our special guest star, Michael Roth, and his advanced skills in Word and PowerPoint. <laughs> to uh, I'm just kidding you, Michael. Um, I, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to talk today about uh, sort of a practical application and how you can think about applying the maturity model thinking to uh, you, you, by using the Power Platform COE. And he'll have lots of interesting things to tell us. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. So we have the usual agenda. We'll we'll just give you a quick overview of the of the maturity model in case you haven't <clears throat> haven't joined us on one of these calls before. Or you're not familiar. Um, we'll do a shout out to everybody who's here and take a take a picture so that we can stick it into the next deck of slides. It's always nice to know we have a nice happy group. Everybody needs to smile and wave. Um, we'll talk about how you can contribute to this effort, and then we'll let Michael take it off and, and talk about his uh, brilliant concepts in the COE and otherwise. Next slide. So you can join us every month. We've uh, we've got a recurring calendar series that that first link, the aka.ms1, will add um, sessions to your calendar every month on the third Tuesday of the month at this time. Um, we do have some gaps in there where we where we take summer vacation and things like that. And then the other place you can you can uh, keep track of where these calls happen. We've uh, the last couple of months added uh, added ourselves to the uh, Power Global Global Microsoft 365 and Power Platform Meetup. So it's just another place that you can subscribe, if you will, to these calls. Simon, you want to take this one? Sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, so, uh, yeah, what is the purpose of all of this? Um, well, it is all about uh, helping organizations improve how they use Microsoft 365. And what we want to do is help uh, organizations and help you to be able to improve the projects you're working on, uh, improve how your businesses uh, collaborate, communicate, all of these competencies which you can see in front of you. Um, there is work going on uh, around uh, um, employee experience and data analytics and security. Uh, we've got tools around how to run workshops with the maturity model for Microsoft 365, you can see there, and, and, and recordings of these uh, practitioner sessions as well. So they're all on, on YouTube uh, and there will be links provided. Um, and we also have um, these articles around how to elevate the competency. So, you know, it's great us saying what the benefits and impacts are, but actually having some idea and the th kind of things and activities you can take to elevate your organization uh, is important too. But yeah, the purpose of all of this is to help you uh, help get um, access to projects, to help your business and the organization you're working in uh, leverage up how it's using Microsoft 365 uh, to achieve these competencies um, and, uh, and align uh, your activities around the competencies which make most sense for, for your organization as well. So um, could I have the next slide, please? And, and and how do we do this? How do we, you know, um, sort of describe uh, this maturity model? Well, like like all other maturity models, we've got different levels and different levels of maturity, um, starting at level 100, uh, working our way up to level 500, which is kind of that sort of it's almost you know impossible place to reach really um, that sort of nirvana. Um, depending on um, your organization, you're going to not to need to be at a particular level um, across all the competencies. We, we sort of, you know, you know, we think that level 300 is the place which you should uh, be in a competency, um, but not every organization needs to be level 300 across all the, the competencies. You know, if you're uh, um, in a industry which is highly regulated then you know you're gonna need to be at a maybe a higher level around sort of government uh, governance and risk compliance but each level um i really really like the intent column because that kind of sort of helps to show where things are so level 100 is that initial level 200 you're working up to a uh, a, a, a level which is consistent and you're kind of doing things you know in the right way level 400 we're measuring and understanding 
how the processes, how the things we're doing uh, could be made better by using measurement uh, and then using uh, those th those uh, measurements to uh, work towards that level 500 uh, level. Next slide, please, Michael. Right, um, so it's picture time. Um, so what we'd like everyone to do is put their cameras on um, and we will have a go at uh, moving to together mode. Um, shall I, I don't mind doing that. Shall I steal the session? Or... Okay, yeah, so that would make sense if you would. Uh... If I put it into together mode, uh, we'll put it in the amphitheater. Never do this. <laughs> there we go. I, I was just being a bit. This slow, is the hardest honest. part of every one of these sessions. It's just I'm not being patient. That's what it is. It's there now. Right. I have got uh, Camtasia all ready to go. So let's. Um, as long as you can it. see us all waving, that's the important thing, right? Okay. Let's. Uh, you're going to uh, record. I am. I am. So let's get that going. All quick. Let's you let us know. Going. We're not going to be all excited okay, so, and exuberant until you tell us. <laughs> right, I'm recording now. So if everyone could be, oh, actually, yeah, there, there we go. Right, Enjo enjoying their themselves and and learning all kinds of wonderful things <laughs> here today. That's brilliant. Just keep going a little bit, like, a little bit longer. We've got uh, everyone in there now. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you very much. I will uh, stop recording, and I'll hand back to you, Michael. Thank you so much. And I head right. over to Mark. <laughs> OK, um, so there, there are a lot of different ways that you can get involved with this effort. This is not intended to be people like Simon and me who are on the core team just talking at you and you know telling you this is the way the world works. The, this is very much an open source project. And you can uh, read the articles that we've published on the um, uh, Microsoft 365 community content repo, but you can also uh, suggest changes. You can you can do pull requests if you know how to use GitHub, or you can talk to each of us. You could uh, also uh, sign up to present a case study if you have had some luck with uh, using these concepts. We'd love to hear about how that works. Um, you could also just you know, let us know what you think. Um, we uh, we occasionally get feedback that says, you know, I've been thinking about this aspect of this competency, and I think it might work better if we went this way. And we take all of that stuff on board. I mean, this is again very much a a conversation. And the the Microsoft 365 landscape moves moves all the time. It's always evolving, as are our organizations. The other thing you can help us do is just let people know that this exists. Um, it's it's gratifying when when some of us go to conferences and, and our speakers or attending and we hear people talking about maturity model and and how it's getting them to a better place. So, you know, anything that you feel like you you could do to help this as a as an effort, even if it's just, you know, just reading the articles and, and using them, that would be awesome. So let us know if you have thoughts. Um, if you need, have any questions or you need help, um, you can always uh, ping the, the Twitter account or uh, leave us a message in that GitHub repo. Here are the upcoming topics. The green one is today. If you couldn't have guessed that, Michael's here with us. We're talking about the Power Platform COE and other topics. Um, next month, Simon Hudson and Sharon Weaver are going to talk about some uh, thinking that they've put together around the employee experience competency. Uh, in June, we'll have uh, a re we'll re we we've started to sort of revisit some of the competencies we've had sessions about before, and we'll talk about the content management competency in June. We'll take a little bit of a summer break, and then we've got some sessions lined up for the fall already. Um, if again, if you have a case study or you want to talk about how uh, the maturity model has been working in in your organization, we have space for you to do that. 
Um, we've talked already a little bit about uh, you know how you can contribute and stuff. Our next session will be next month, May, um, uh, talking about the employee experience competency. This is this every month the same time unless we're taking a break. Those are all the folks who joined us for March, so thank you for doing that. Um, we do uh, grab your names just so that we can prove to ourselves that we are having a purpose here. So we appreciate you joining us. And finally, the, the, the main event. So Michael, thanks for, for clicking us through the beginning slides and uh, we'll hand it over to you to uh, share your thoughts on, on uh, the Power Platform COE. Thank you so much and thanks for having me. And I'm really proud that I could prove to anyone that I know the office tools and I can click through slides. <laughs> if you've Not everyone's good at that, Michael, it's a skill. <laughs> it is a skill, and, and after I've just demonstrated how bad I am with the auto-saving feature in Word, so I needed, I needed this win. All right. So um, I'm sure most of you are uh, well known with the, with the rules. If you have questions and thoughts, please raise your hand, unmute yourself, and just talk in, because I don't always see all the participants. I do have my notes over here. You are over there, and the presentation is over there. So um, if I don't see you, please just... Uh, make me see you and um, then we go and I start with a little bit of an introduction because I guess not everyone knows me hi there I'm Michael uh, this is me uh, in case if you have questions afterwards or ideas or want to correct me you can do this in this call or after this call um, usually I'm on Twitter and on LinkedIn Michael Roth 42 um, and also my blog is under that name so I hope you can find me if you just recognize 42. Um, and yeah, a little bit about my background. Um, because Mark gave it away, I work with Power Platform. But actually, I'm coming from the business side or the M365 side to Power Platform. Um, so uh, if you have any dynamics question, just please don't ask me because I'm not familiar with that. Um, and I'm specialized in governance, administration, and licensing. So all the fun parts, basically. I'm very happy uh, that I can do that. I work as a solution architect at a big company with an orange logo and also as a freelancer on uh, thepoweraddicts.com. So if you have any questions or want some kind of coaching with Power Platform Administration or have any licensing questions, you can ping me there. You can work with them. And... If I'm not doing that, so if I'm not sitting here at my desk and staring at a screen the whole day, I do have some offline hobbies and I want to share these. Uh, because sometimes I have to remind myself that I do have offline hobbies and that are plants. You can't see that, but you can see in the background a little bit of green and there's green. My whole house is covered in plants. And I like to go camping as well and board games. I'm a board game geek, definitely. So if one of these sparks your interest and you want to chat me up afterwards, you can do that. And um, before I go into the content now, Power Platform COE, um, I would like to talk about what a C actually is, because um, there's always a lot of confusion if you talk about or use the abbreviation COE in Power Platform. And I'm already a little bit confused myself because uh, Mark was just saying um, practical application. And when I hear that, I always think about the Power Platform COE, Center of Excellence Starter Kit, which is... Uh, Microsoft uh, developed a bunch of applications from the PowerCat team, but CUE also stands for um, Center of Excellence as an organizational uh, part. And usually when I talk to my customers, they uh, hire me when they have a governance and administration and compliance questions around Power Platform. One of my first questions is, do you have a CUE? And usually they say, yeah, sure, it's yeah, we do. And then I'm very happy and say, great, that's a, that's a fantastic start. And then they add something like it's a little bit old and not properly functioning, or but we need to update it or something like that. We've installed it and haven't done anything else. And that is where the confusion, start, confusion starts. Um, because most people in my area where I work in Power Platform think about the Center of Excellence Starter Kit um, when I say COE. But I usually think about an organizational group of people centered around the Power Platform. That is a Power Platform CUE. So I would like to start with a definition. It's a bit long, 
not not that long, and I will read it to you. Um, but if you go through the slides afterwards, you can still have it. So a center of excellence for Power Platform is a group of people that focuses on nurturing and investing in organic growth while maintaining governance and control. It's designed to drive innovation and improvement. And as a central function, it can break down geographic and organizational silos. This is not the COE what I'm talking about. And since Mark seems to be cool with that, we were talking about the same thing before that session. <laughs> okay. So, and the, the very important thing why I talk about the organizational unit uh, center of excellence is in my second part of the um, definition. And this is more or less what I wanted to uh, deliver at the very begun, beginning. It's important to note that while the COE starter kit provides some automation and tooling, this is the COE kit with the icon on the right hand side, um, to help teams building monitoring and automation necessary to support a COE or organizational unit and managing it, it requires more than tools alone. And that is one of the first um, lessons that I would like to be heard here. Uh, when you talk about Power Platform and managing Power Platform or thinking about governance or administration or want to have Power Platform properly functioning in your organization, you don't need just the tools, but you need people and processes and communication. And that is what a COE Center of Excellence, this group of people actually provides. The tools that the COE kit provides, they are just a good help, but the COE kit with the full glory of its name, it's the Center of Excellence Starter Kit. It is a starter kit, and it's supposed to help you start and get started. But today we are talking about a COE. So in short, the COE aligns business goals through different business units. It breaks down silos, drives innovation and adoption, and it maintains oversight and governance. So basically it's an organizational unit that makes it clear who is doing what, when, and why, which is incredibly helpful. So keep in mind for the next 20 minutes or 30 minutes or so, the COE kit is not the COE that we are talking about. And I'm still a little bit, I don't want to don't want to say mad, maybe disappointed, that we have the organizational unit a center of excellence, and then we have a center of excellence starter kit. That is really one unlucky branding uh, or naming. But yeah, we have to deal with it now. So the COE I'm talking about, it's about people, communication, and processes. And I think we all work, when we all work in tech or with tech, I still think that people, communication, and processes is actually the thing that everything should evolve around. Technic should always and can always help us, but could never replace us. So um, why do we need a COE, a center of accent. I hope I already provided some basic benefits in the slide before, like tech shouldn't um, uh, get get rid of people. And it's always around people and, and communication. Um, but apart from that, there's something else that, that I see in my daily work. Um, because when I work with Power Platform, I always get contacted by the IT department of my customers. And the IT people usually start to think from the tools rather than from people, communication or processes. So I do love nice, shiny tools that I can play around with, especially when it comes to Power Platform. But um, in Power Platform, we have a highly neglected part and species, so to say, that is seriously underdeveloped, and that is the administration and governance part. And that always makes me a little bit sad because um, most Power Platform administrators that I've met in my life were usually those people that um, just happened to play around with Power Platform the most or went to the wrong meeting at the wrong time and then suddenly there were Power Platform administrators or even worse, Power Platform owners. And if you just build a bunch of apps and flows and suddenly you're, you're an environment owner, for example, then that doesn't mean that you know anything. That what, what's to do? What's, what's your responsibility? But that happens ever so often. I would say 90% of my customers do have this thing. And I also have a th theory of why that is. Because I often see the classic Microsoft marketing strategy for Power Platform. It's, the Power Platform is fast and easy and everyone can do it. So there's no hassle. Um, and when it comes to that, I'm kind of in a, in a, in a, in a mixed place 
because um, Power Platform can be fast and easy, yes, but it can also be difficult and complex. And how I see it is that the Power Platform has two main purposes, and that is one, democratizing IT. That means citizen developer can create apps and flows for their personal productivity. So uh, even I, I don't have a tech background originally. I learned to build my first Power Platform flows with Power Platform, and that was really great. Now I'm working full-time in IT, which is great. The other purpose is speeding up business-critical IT development. So people with a tech background, developer and IT people can use the platform to build business-critical application and services way faster than with our Power Platform. And when I see the marketing strategy from Microsoft that aims to, mainly towards the citizen developer, and that leads to some common or statements, common statements or questions that I get from my customers nearly every time I work with a new customer. And that maybe you've heard one or two of those. I hope not, but maybe. So when we talk about Power Platform and how to adopt it in the organization, how to manage it, how to administer it, I always feel like it's quick and easy. So why do we need proper governance approach? Microsoft should have built that in. Or it's quick and easy, so clearly someone can administer the whole thing next to their current job, right? Or isn't it part of most M365 licenses anyway? So why do we need to pay extra attention here? That is something that I hear ever so often, and it really brings me to a state where I need to remind myself to breathe in and breathe out. It's it's It can be a little bit frustrating. I, I don't want to just blame Microsoft and the marketing strategy. I think there are uh, different reasons and more reasons to that. But fact is, and I would really like to highlight that, is that the administration and governance and the managing of the power platform is highly neglected. And a COE, and especially a COE in combination with a maturity model, can help us here. Because whenever I hear those phrases and those questions or those responses from my customers, I, um, uh, I usually feel a bit uncomfortable. Um, because I then have a lot of follow-up questions for the Power Platform, and I um, just found a few one that I would like to share here. For example, who owns the platform? Who decides who the uh, how the platform is actually used? Or do you want it for citizen development, or do you want to empower your developers in IT department? Maybe both. What about fusion teams? That's another uh, thing that gets highlighted ever so often. Do you have coding guidelines, like a naming convention? Do you have two different things in your company, like COE and a COE, and everyone gets confused? And how do you manage new updates, updates and new connectors? Because there are new connectors being published for Power Platform like every other week. Do you have a dedicated admin or even better, a teams or a team of administrators? How do you make sure your technical setups meet your vision of your usage in the organization? How do you prevent data leakage? And so on, and so on, and so on. So I got lots and lots and lots of questions. And maybe you can guess what the typical response and the answer is. Something like this. Mm, well, yeah. Well, we have an idea, but yeah. So the most of my customers basically tell me that they do have thought about all of that. And then I ask for some kind of documentation. Have you written it down? And then... I get this answer like, um, yeah, well, maybe, almost, technically. Well, we have an Excel document with some words in there. Um, but this can get, uh, really is, is, is an issue. Because what I see in my daily work is that most organizations don't really think about how to manage the platform. And often that's because it's fast and it's easy and everyone can do it. So we don't need to pay extra attention here. And in short, there's chaos all over the place. Because when I get into a new organization, there is hardly any documentation about what's done and what is not done. There is no communication from, uh, let's say, an IT team or a management team to the makers or citizen developers. There's usually hundreds and sometimes even thousands of apps and flows, most of them in the default environment, and lots of them are called test one, two, three, or something like that. It's very chaotic. There are various licenses. Some have been distributed by the IT department. Other have, others have been purchased by the users themselves. Uh, there's no ALM or staging concept like development, testing, production. Uh, there's a large number of orphan flows and apps. So it's absolute chaos. And with this chaos usually comes confusion for the citizen developer and maker. Uh, there are security risks and data leakages. 
And that usually leads to um, that the adoption of Power Platform in general is getting slowed down or that organization altogether say, well, maybe that isn't the tool that we thought it is and maybe we shouldn't use it. And I think that's that would be a shame and a pity because Power Platform is great. I'm a huge fan. And um, the maturity model can help with a lot of those questions. So um, I'm not really sure how well that is known, um, but during my research, uh, I've looked into the uh, community docs once again, and I stumbled upon a maturity model for the Power Platform that already exists, but not in the repository where all the other maturity models exist. Are you aware of that team? Mark and Simon, hmm. you know that, right? Yes, yes, we, we talked about it about, I don't know, was it three years ago? I think, yeah, yeah. I, okay. think, I think they uh, built it based, they, they, it, they was inspired by our maturity model, I think. Um, that, that could be, yeah. So, and I took a little bit of inspiration from that. Uh, so how could a version one look like? Um, and I wanted to use the table that you showed at the beginning, Simon, with a level 100 to 500, and how that basically could look for a, a power platform, just to make it easier to think about all the bits and pieces that we have. Um, but before I dive into the categories, that I would use for a Power Platform COD. I would like to show you a little overview that I use on a regular basis um, and ask my customers how the power, how they want the Power Platform to operate. And then I usually, just to get them started in, in how to think, what to think, because Power Platform isn't like Power Platform in every other organization. Um, I have this graphic where I say, how does a Power Platform work in your organization? You see uh, those three um, columns with BU, that's business units, and then quite often we have a centralized power platform from a technical point of view, and then we have a center of excellence. So this um, group of people from different business units who decide how the power platform should operate, how the governance rules are, and so on and so on. So the COE manages the platforms for the whole, whole organization and for every business unit. But that doesn't necessarily have to be true for every organization. This one is also a, a different model that works well. If you have business units that work in really varying um, units and departments and their work really differs from each other, then maybe you need more than one CUE, Center of Excellence, that really manages how the power platform works in that line of, of business. Or you just break it down into different environments with PCs, so terms and conditions in between. So if you have a rather large, a large organization, that you can say we just have one center of excellence and one technical setup for the power platform, but different environments may need different rules. So the business unit manages their own power platform with the help of a centralized center of excellence. This alone, if I just present this this graphic, most of my customers start to think and say, oh, "Okay, it's not really, it's not, it's not." Uh, a no-brainer, we have to think about how does it work for us? How does it make sense for us? And based from there, I've looked into the uh, version one of the maturity model categories that have been uh, published, I think by the PowerCat team or by somebody uh, from, um, from the team that also developed the COE starter kit. And they have a lot of categories where they uh, try to make the whole power platform thing a little bit smaller and break it down a bit. And they have seven categories. And um, strategy and vision, business value, admin and governance, support, nurture and citizen makers, automation and fusion teams. And while this is these are good categories, I think they are a lot and doesn't really uh, doesn't make it too easy. If you haven't thought about your categories and your strategy, how to manage a platform, then going through seven categories and with each and every category go through a maturity model from level 100 to 500, it can get very, um, you can get lost very easily. So, um, and as Simon just mentioned, this um, model is a couple of years old already and it hasn't been updated yet. So I tried to start to make it a little bit easier and break it down a little bit. Um, and I just got all these categories and sorted them in a new way. So I think strategy and vision is a very good category. Um, and I think it always and also includes business value, 
since a good strategy should always cover business value as, as well. Otherwise, it's just not a good strategy, but some random strategy. And most organizations I know don't use random strategies, but they try to think before they act. Then admin and governance, my favorite category ever. That's good. Uh, user and training. I would also like to include support in that because basically whatever a user does, uh, I don't care if it's a citizen maker or a developer, they all need support and they all need training at some point in a di different level. So I put all the people in one, one category. Then we have the processes. And uh, basically what happens in the old uh, model is that automation means processes. And I always think when I talk about automation with people, they think about how can I get rid of all those annoying processes and just automate them. But uh, they just don't think about all the processes that we have. For example, one of my favorites is the on and off boarding. Um, if I talk to any IT department or any power platform manager or something like that, they never think about on and off boarding because that's, this is HR and we are here in IT. We are power platform folks. So HR is not our business. But on and off boarding is a very important process when, you, when it comes to power platform because at some point, when someone new starts in your organization, you, they need to know what they can do, what they are allowed to do and what not. So I all usually talk about processes in general, in the whole organization, because that's where we want the Power Platform to be used and productive. The last part is then adoption, because I think adoption includes the nurturing part and not always, not just for citizen makers, but for other people as well, as well as for fusion teams, because Fusion teams, basically, if you're not familiar with that term, is a combination from citizen developer or citizen maker or people without any IT background, just new in the platform, learning their first steps. They work together with experienced developer who may or may not have experience in the Power Platform already. But bringing those two people together is a fusion team. It's called a fusion team by Microsoft, and that can be really interesting. Um, because the one really knows uh, how development works and the other part, uh, usually the citizen maker usually come from the business side of the organization and they know the processes by heart. And if you put them both in a group and teach them how to talk to each other, um, then something magical can happen. But yes, they don't, that needs adoption on both ends. So, and I think if I break it down to strategy and vision, admin and governance, user training processes and adoption, then I have a good five point five uh, point plan that i can go through with every company and um, that makes it even easier from my point of view uh, to go through the different parts of power platform now if i would look at those five categories and um and put them down to the maturity model so the level 100 to 500 um, i did this for two of those i think for admin and governance just because I love it so much, and process, I think. And I would like to show you what I got and where I end up. All right. Um, level 100 is at the very top. This is the initial stage. And Simon just said, at this stage, the organization has just started using the Power Platform and there's no formal governance or administration. Keep in mind, we are at the admin and governance example here. So there's no governance or administration in place. The focus is on experimentation and learning. And that's where most of Microsoft customers are at the very beginning. They just start to click here and there. And everyone who, um, as uh, every organization who didn't really switch off Power Platform, you know, um, in most business licenses, Power Platform pieces, Power Apps, Power Automate, for example, are included. So that's where all the wild growth of apps and flows is usually coming from. On level 200, repeatable, we, the organization has started to put some structure around the deployment of Power Platform. There may or may not be some basic governance policies in place and some oversight of Power Platform resources. That is usually the stage where the Center of Excellence Starter Kit comes in place, which is basically a bunch of tools and apps and flows that helps you to manage the Power Platform and to put in some governance and guidance. When we come to level 300, um, that is, as Simon said, that is the sweet spot usually. That is where you want to be. And at this level, the organization has a clear understanding of the role of Power Platform in its IT portfolio, which is great. 
And there are defined governance policies and procedures. And there's a system for managing Power Platform resources. And if you ask me, this really is the place where you want to be. Because you don't have to max it out to level 500. But this is where you are safe, where you have clear communication towards your users. Some of the processes are automated. Life is good. If you want more, then there's always room for more and improvement. But this is really a, a nice level. And um, if you are working in, a, in an organization and the Power Platform is used and you think, maybe I don't think we are at level 300, um, I just can assure you that uh, 80 85 percent of my customers are not on level 300 but actually think they are on 400 but anyway um, level 400 capable the organization has a mature governance and administration process in place there's a dedicated team responsible for overseeing the use of power platform across the organization um, this is something that i actually would like to see because most of the time when i talk to power platform administrators this is a one person job or just one person has the, all the responsibility to manage the power platform, which is usually um, basically a, a team job. If, if you are not working in an organization of 20 to 30 people, but you have more, then you should have at least two administrators. This is just a lot and lots of work. Um, but yeah, reality looks quite different. And level 500 it is the highest level of maturity. The organization has a highly efficient and effective governance and administration process. The use of Power Platform is fully integrated into the organization's IT strategy. And you may realize that those um, explanations are not very defined and concrete. And that is because whatever that means, a highly efficient and effective governance and administration process, that differs from organization to organization. So this but gives you a general direction of how it should look like, how it should feel like. And um, yeah, if you are familiar or if you want to dive into the, um, the explanation how to create the maturity model workshop that Simon and Mark just mentioned at the beginning, this is something that you can have fun with for the whole day to define what's important, what's not important, which level you are on and how to get to the next step. Um, that was an example for admin and governance, and I have also another one for the processes. And I think if we just go through some of those, it, uh, it's already sufficient. At the initial level 100, um, you have ad hoc processes. So they're used informal, undocumented, and inconsistent. Something is happening. I need something. I see something. Maybe I can solve with Power Platform. Let's just go. Um, so there's no standardization in place. At level 200, once again, we start with a little bit of documentation. We have processes that occur over and over again, and maybe those processes may define our business. And then we have identified those and written those down. Um, and then we go through the different level um, when we... Um, see those processes and then we can define a governance framework around them that those governance framework really helps and supports our processes and not that the governance is just there and blocks access or blocks different connectors or something like that um, that is really really important that the framework for the power platform and the managing administration and governance of the power platform should always support your processes but with a maturity model what i also like if you go through your processes you can start to assess your processes because sometimes we work with processes that are maybe from the 80s and the 80s are not 20 years ago but 40 years by now if you make the same mistake i do um yeah and level 400 and 500 once again those are those levels where you try to indicate your examples uh, your processes and your framework in maybe kpis or maybe into your core strategy of your organization so that it gets really efficient and that you don't have to think about, now what would we do with the Power Platform? But that it's clear and it's a no-brainer that Power Platform is an, is an um, integrated part of your whole organization. But most of the organizations that I've met don't get there. But some do and they are very happy, happy with it. So yeah, um, I think the maturity model is, is a great model actually to, to, um, to chunk down the big 
part that you have, especially with a power platform and especially with a power platform COE. I haven't really talked about tools that may help you with all of that because I think really a center of excellence should, should start with, with the people, with the processes and with communication. And um, I would really like to go through my different categories and put them all into a table like that to see how it could work. Um, but maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. So uh, conclusion. Uh, the COE, Center of Excellence for Power Platform, is an organizational unit to focus on people, communication, and processes. I hope I make it that clear. And this is not the COE kit. Another cool thing, but not the same. Power Platform is not always super easy and everyone can do it. <laughs> At least the management administration require proper dedication. This is really important. And... Um, I realized that because Microsoft has just started to paying attention to administration. Um, and it's, for me at least, it's visible by how poorly administrators and the management of the platform is being handled in general. Um, and especially in the recent events or recent months, I would have to add that taking care of administration does not mean to bring out a new feature called managed environments. Um, that's a whole different story, basically, uh, that I don't want to get into because that could lead to another 30 to 40 minutes of me talking. Um, but yeah, um, they just started and I give them credit for that. This is good. But it's absolutely important to start with people, processes instead of tools and apps. Um, I think that can really help the Tree Power Platform as a serious business platform. That's not just easy and fast and everyone can do it but the power platform can solve serious and critical business problems and um, before i close my part i would just like to hint out the resources that i have because i do have the center of excellence overview the first one uh, the power platform that is the sex, uh, center of excellence starter kit the bunch of tools not the organizational unit that i've talked about for the last 20 minutes and then something um, uh, where I would like to uh, be a little, a little bit shameless and advertise on my own behalf, because uh, me and a good friend of mine from England, um, Craig White, uh, has uh, we just started a blog series about Power Platform administration and governance. So if you are new to that, or if you think that you or your organization might need it, please just visit the PPAC attack. PPAC is in short for Power Platform Admin Center. Um, series in platforms of power that is the blog of craig white i mentioned my blog already michael roth 42 and right now we are publishing every week another article another blog post around power platform administration and governance and um actually i think in uh, in the european power platform conference in a couple of months we are giving a power platform administration workshop and after that we are thinking of somehow building a new admin, admin community maybe around the Power Platform. Maybe we can uh, reach out to existing communities, but we want to nurture the admins basically and um, deserve them a little bit or give them a little bit of um, attention that they deserve. And the last thing is the Power Platform adoption maturity model that I just mentioned. That is the one from the CUE kit, kit, the one with the seven subcategories I just mentioned. That is the existing documentation that we have so far. And with that, one last thing to say. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, comments, stories to share or something else, please. We have we had one question from Francisco. Um, how can we elaborate a business justification for a service account to administer Power Platform? Is it better than having individual accounts with admin roles and licenses? Yeah, um, I'm a little bit uh, torn when it comes to service accounts. On the one hand side, I do see the upsides because um, especially when you manage the Power Platform and you, you often use Power Platform tools, when your account gets um, leaves an organization, all the flows and apps that you own, they will stop, which is not good. So a service account that doesn't happen with a service account. 
On the other hand, if you have two or three administrators that share one service account, then you don't have a clear transparency about who did what. If I change a flow, a trigger of a flow with a service account, then I don't see which one of my three administrators really did it. Um, but in general, I highly recommend, especially for the administration, to use service accounts because um, when people get sick or hit by a bus and get to the hospital or something like that, the account usually gets uh, blocked or at least um, paused, but a service account can be used by someone else. So especially in the administration, I do like service accounts, but it makes sense to take care that you can trace who did what just for the worst case. Yeah, that, that That's always seemed to me like a gap in the way uh, Microsoft engineered the power platform in that it's it it's very empowering for you know whatever you want to call them a dessert a developer sorry a departmental uh user or a, a citizen developer but it's not so great and you you've talked about this at, from an administrative perspective to make sure that everything stays up and running because people come and go yep that is absolutely that is a challenge and there's no just one right or wrong answer. It always depends. I mean, of course, I'm a consultant. It all depends. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, um, there are so many different forms and organizations and so many uh, things that you need to consider. Yes, use service account, but yes, be smart about it. Something like that. <laughs> and a follow on question. I don't know if you see it. And, and is a service principle an alternative to this? Yes, service principles are absolutely an alternative for that. Um, I'm not really sure if um, a service principle, so the Center of Excellence Starter Kit, the bunch of tools that help you manage and, and go on the uh, Power Platform, basically is a very excellent starting point, And I highly recommend using it or checking it out. I'm not really sure if that can be deployed from a service principle. I wish uh, Craig was here because he's really into the COE starter kit lately. Um, but if you reach out to me, maybe through email or one of the social media, LinkedIn or Twitter, and can send me this question, then I will take a little bit of time, put a little bit of research into that, and then come back with a reply. If that would be okay for you. Michael, the, the, you know, the Microsoft are sort of slowly moving over so more connectors support the service principles, uh, you know, and they, they're not yeah. there yet, are they? Yeah, yeah. Understood. Yeah, that, that's why I think not all the flows that really have you manage the Power Platform are already good to go for service principles. I'm not sure, but I can I can check it out and see what I have in my archive around best practices for service principles. It was interesting, you know, you're sort of saying, um, you know, the naming of the COE starter kit wasn't a great name. It, it did, you know, it got me, if no one has any other questions, but it did get me thinking, well, what should it be called? You know, should it be uh, the beginner's kit? I don't know. It's, uh, yeah. Starter kit would be great. Or, I don't know, administration kit, something like that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. There are a few other naming options here, I guess. <laughs> But um, I just uh, heard that Microsoft is rebranding a lot of the administration and governance things that they have, uh, some of the admin centers as well. So we get a whole new wave of rebranding and renaming. So let's hope for the best. Finger cro fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting how, how this stuff just keeps coming around. I mean, you'd think that Microsoft would have a pattern of you know, when we launch something, these are the minimum things that we need, and this is the kind of admin support that we need. This is the kind of end user support that we need. But it's always launch, 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 and then backfill. Yeah, yeah, that is that is absolutely true, and I see it especially with Power Platform that uh, they just published all the possibilities, and only after that they thought about security. And um, many of my customers now face the challenge that they have. Uh, 3,000-ish flows, but uh, basically those flows can be started from other tenants as well. So tenant isolation is a is a buzzword for Microsoft right now, and it's super difficult to just clean this up afterwards because this is all productive now. Yeah. 
But yeah, somebody mentioned it. I st we still love Microsoft. <laughs> Pia, you got your hand up. Yeah. I sometimes use this, the the term this is like sometimes it's hard to love Microsoft, <laughs> and especially when it comes to this, uh, because I was working with a very large organization. They had over ninety thousand, uh, actually like ninety six thousand uh, licenses. It was a school, oh, yeah. and they were thinking about doing this. And but then it was just like, but how can we manage it? Uh, how can we move these things between? How can we make sure that some of these flows are uh, just, you know, go nuts? Uh, or, or some of them, like, how can we make sure that when we use the Power Platform for something that's actually being elevated into having a larger business value to control that? And when mm -hmm. it's like, I don't know. And then they're like, <laughs> okay, then we're not going to do it then we're yep. just not going to do it. And that is what, what the business, like when, when we talk about the technical stuff that comes out to technical people, like we will try it, we will play with it, we will be working with it. But when it comes to the business saying like, okay, I'm going to actually put, you know, two people working with this with one manager, we're going to have a service description that says that we we're going to do, we're going to start an internal champions program for, a, you know, citizen developer, and that's going to be run by the architecture team that's going to, you know, implement their architectural principles, and also be the watchdog or to see, okay, where are, you, where are we going over the line with the security? And where do we go over the line financially? Because, you know, you, you, the Azure uh, pay as you go, that is dangerous. That's a risk. Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, from the business side, and looking, looking at this, who are totally unimpressed with everything technical because they're like, yeah, there's AI, yeah, we have Teslas on, on Mars. Um, they're not impressed. They're not going to be playing around with it. They're just going to see like, no, too big of a risk. We're going to say no. We're going to do this in some other technology. They don't have to choose. Um, yeah. So I think Microsoft really bit themselves a little bit in the tail by doing this. And also we want to be able to, you know, the service accounts um, or at least be like, OK, now we have leveled this flow to something important. Then it will go into this not a maybe not a service account, but it will be managed and cannot like like a retention policy. This cannot mm -hmm. be deleted. This is important. We need to keep this. Um, so like. It's very hard to love Microsoft on, on this one. Um, I, I, I think it's difficult. Yeah, absolutely. And especially when I th see that uh, all Power Automate flows, for example, uh, to, to stay at your example, are running uh, in, in, in a personal account or in what kind of account ever. It, it's like when it's, it's a business flow that is not really related to a, an account whatsoever. Should it be in Power Platform? Or should it be somewhere else i mean we do have logic apps and other functions that basically do the same thing but they are not that approachable or not that easy to to work with for 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 a citizen developer for example and there mm -hmm. should really should be a line like what is power platform really supposed to be and what is so what is, is it more for citizen developer or is it more for business critical applications maybe there there is a, a good reason that there are two different tools for that yeah, and trying to get everything in one in one in the power platform that can be difficult and that really creates it, artificial challenges actually. Yeah, yeah but it, I think like it, Microsoft sorry. have been able to do this. You know, when we think about documents, like yes, we have OneDrive for your stuff and SharePoint for the common stuff. Exactly. Um, and also when we think about the the power that is out there with the citizen developers, um, I'm, I jokingly, uh, jokingly talk about uh, finance people that they can land a plane in Excel spreadsheet. Um, <laughs> if we would empower them to do this stuff, they could actually take it and really fly. But then it'd be like, oh, no, it's that guy in finance and he left now. So I don't know. Uh, like this, uh, this whole financial thing and reporting and everything is like, no, it's just gone. Um, and I'm like, okay. And then also, wouldn't it be nice with some, you know, like a GitHub kind of thing that we can have versioning control of our flow? So be like, okay, this is how oh, it used yeah. to be. This is how it is now. Um, 
uh, the, the financial people uh, lending planes in Excel is there's in every organization there's at least one extra it's full of macros and no one is allowed to delete it because that holds basically the whole financial plan of the organization yeah I, yeah it it's a charge but yeah that's that's how it is and that's what we face so <laughs> Uh, Michael, if if you wouldn't mind going to the our last slide, we just want to make sure that we get those oh, links up in front of people so that absolutely uh, there were some questions about how to uh, follow along with videos or uh, you know, prior sessions yeah. and things like that. Yeah. All of these links, which we'll we'll make available to you at that slide deck link in a few minutes after the call, will uh, get you to the all the historical stuff and uh, these slides as well. And uh, I have to add, I'm really sorry, I pixelated Parker here because I'm a huge oh. 8-bit and pixel fan. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not your uh, your internet connection. That was me. <laughs> that's awesome. That's very cool. Any last minute questions before we uh, close things off? Got a couple more minutes. This has been a, a really good session, Michael. I mean, I think. I think you've you've shown the value of taking the maturity model thinking and applying it to a a, a new or a different uh, discipline than what we've written up so far. You know, mm -hmm. one of the things we've tried to do is avoid writing about specific technologies because we're trying to give people general tools, but we want people to take those general tools and apply them the way you're you're talking through here. So this is awesome. Thank you so yeah, much for uh, joining us with this. Yeah, I th I th and thanks. Uh, I, I think that really makes sense, especially for Power Platform, because when you're Power Platform, you think about tools and flows and stuff, but not about the organizational part behind that, the business part. And this is so, so important. Yeah, I think you've, you've made it very clear that uh, having some sort of center of excellence, I've always said this about SharePoint, the, the yeah. most successful organizations have a group of people who will at least answer questions. And you know, treat people who are the end users of these things, or the people who want to build on it, with some sort of respect and and helpfulness. <laughs> it's a customer service role in a lot of in a lot of ways, um, but that group of people needs to continue continually get better. And the center of excellence is really a great way to frame that. Yeah, still got you. No. Got your hand up again. <laughs> I got my hand up again. Um, yes. On your slide for governance um, that you had, uh, I would like um, an addition, uh, um, uh, a suggestion. Yes, um, please. To the organization for the steps, like for the you know 100 level, you just have someone who's technically savvy and interested and level one, you have, this is the responsibilities that they have. And then also like we could add some of the, you know, recommended certification from Microsoft Learn. And then as we move up, we'll be like, okay, you will have to have someone responsible. And also this is the person who has a budget for the pay as you go. Um, yeah. thing. Uh, and also who has, <clears throat> responsibility for running a governance group with the uh, with a citizen developer and explain like the role citizen developer uh, uh, the uh, architect and and my when personally I think this should be owned by architecture the the internal architecture yeah. so yeah. like I I work a lot with adoption like that's what I do I do digital leadership so uh, when I put up the like Microsoft Center of Excellence for a company, I say like, okay, we're gonna have a champions group. And that could be someone from the support who's driving the champions and like, these are new tech, this is new stuff. And then we have the digital leadership and who's driving that is someone, you know, a senior person like myself, who is like, how you're supposed to think, how you're gonna run your business um, with these tools. And when it comes to power platform, that should be run from architecture because these are our principles. This is our information classification that you need to do. This is how we're going to use the data lakes and things like that. So it really should be run like that because then we can also attach like the costs to it and attach the costs and the business decisions 
to the proper place where it belongs. And it does belong in architecture. They usually fight me on this because they're like, oh, we're cool. We don't do citizen developers. I'm like, well, then you're taking a step out from, you know, the business value that you pull to the business uh, because you need to support the business even when they are empowering themselves. Uh, so you need to coach them to do that. Um, and I think that would be amazing to add to that governance. So they would say like, okay, if you want to go here, you have to get a budget. You really do. Um, and then always, you know, risk based stuff. Uh, that's when people don't give me money, I give them risks. <laughs> so um, just correct me if I'm wrong. If you, if I got you right, is uh, I think Craig and I are going to write lots of this, what I just said down to the community docs, and then we ping you to get your additions to that. <laughs> is that correct? Yeah. Is that what you said? Great. Awesome. Um, I'll be happy to put my two cents in. Good. Awesome. Right. Well, we, we will call it a day there. Then thanks very much for everyone attending. Uh, have great weeks. No doubt we see people on the next matur uh, maturity model session, uh, which is May the 21st, and maybe the next community call, which is on now, if you're still interested in the Power Platform. So uh, take care. All. Have lovely weeks. Thank you so much, Michael. It was a brilliant session. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a great one.